The session is being recorded and any of the presentations that are presented yesterday and today will be made available after the um, after this training. So don't feel like you have to write absolutely everything down. I'm going to ask people to mute themselves if you're not speaking. Uh, sometimes there's an echo. Sometimes if you're on your keyboard, you can kind of hear it in the background. And it can be a little bit distracting for speakers. Yesterday's session focused mostly on organizational change and how do we change systems within services to be more aware of the mental health needs of young people that come through homeless services. Um, and we looked at things like psychologically informed environments, we looked at uh, strengths-based approaches, how do we do mental health outreach. Um, and then of course we had the presentation from Adam Burley, which focused more on the importance of being able to build these types of relationships within our services. Um, sorry, I'm just adding more people into the into the call. Today's session um, is focused a little bit more on what are individual practices that we can develop within services. Um, sorry, just making sure people are joining. Um, we want to talk about what are individual services that we can develop within practices. Um, so we've lined up three practices this morning. And the idea is that, and this is something that came up in the breakout sessions yesterday afternoon, or yesterday, uh, almost afternoon, uh, coming towards lunchtime. The idea that sometimes we don't always have to formalize mental health supports into formal counseling sessions um, and that a lot of the time what we need to do is to have these informal ways of building relationships with young people in a little bit more um, of an informal way and kind of get them into the service, get them to uh, build relationships and trust. Uh, rather than necessarily treating people as patients all the time and diagnosing problems um, and developing very formal treatments. So the idea with today's practices are there are things that we hope you can model within your own services. Um, um, so I think with that, I am pretty sure we're happy to start. If anybody has any questions, as always, you can throw it into the chat box or you can raise your hand. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, which is Emma Wilkinson, who's joining us from the Rock Trust in Scotland. The Rock Trust is a organization that's based across Scotland, working predominantly with young people experiencing homelessness. And Emma works as a art therapist with the Rock Trust, and she's going to present some of the supports that they have in place for young people to meet their mental health needs. Um, Emma, I'm just going to make you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Um, are you able to join us, Emma? You're still muted. Sorry. Perfect. Um, let me... So is it under... Uh, share screen. There we go. Is that? Are you still able to see that? That like has it gone? Oh yeah, it's uh, it's propped up. Yeah, we can see it now. Perfect. Okay, great. So yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Emma Wilkinson. I'm um, an art therapist and the health and wellbeing team leader. And I'm going to be talking today about how our program fits in and works towards the goals of the Rock Trust of ending youth homelessness through supporting young people's mental health. So I'm going to start with kind of introducing myself, a brief introduction into my theories and how I work, um, and then how our program fits in to um, the goals of the Rock Trust and kind of what we offer. So um, I'm a transpersonal psychologist and an art therapist. So I get a lot of questions of what does that mean? Um, so I'm gonna kind of break it down today and just talk a little really brief theory on them and then go into who it might be appropriate for and what it looks like in sessions and like in the setting. So just starting with transpersonal psychology, um, which is a holistic approach to therapy that welcomes the body, mind and spirit into the therapy room. It's a combination of modern Western psychology and Eastern approaches. Um, so who this might be good for? 
uh, someone who might be experiencing like an existential crisis, um, someone who's feeling separated from their body and mind, which can happen as we know with trauma, that separation. Um, someone who maybe is like really focused on the future or the past and they're wanting to connect a bit more into the present, which we also know can happen with trauma as well, that kind of feeling of always anticipating what's next, a bit leaning in. Um, someone who is processing anything passed down between generations, so ancestral grief or um, trauma that's been passed down into your generations as well. But in general, it's a tool that I use and an approach I use in the therapy settings. So what it looks like is um, doing mindfulness interventions, a lot of body, breath work, present focus, guided visualizations. Um, we have this existential kind of approach that incorporates like peak experience and near-death experiences, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later as well. Um, so jumping into our therapy, I apologize, you guys, this is the only slide that doesn't have images <laughs> and um, it's a lot of text, um, but I really wanted to share this with you because I, I enjoy it. It's the um, definition from the American Art Therapy Association and we're just going to break it down a little bit today. Um, so art therapy is an integrative mental health and human service profession that enriches the lives of individuals, families, and communities. So that's just kind of talking about who it's appropriate for. So we work in a bunch of different settings, it could be individual one-to-one -one work, it could be group work, it can be family work. And then we'll come back to this idea of communities as well. Um, so through active art making process, creative process, applied psychology theory, and the human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. So again, this is coming back to that, um, that key point of the relationship, right? So it's art making in a psychotherapeutic relationship and that's that key part, the relationship really. Um, art therapy supports personal and relationship treatment goals as well as community concerns. So going into that community kind of social justice, artists are, they hold up you know, a mirror to, um, to our society. They show those parts of society that maybe have been neglected or ashamed or abandoned, the parts of society that um, we're, we're maybe ignoring or pushing to the side, right? And as we talked about yesterday, we all go into this work because we care about people, we believe in people, we believe in their strengths and their abilities. Um, and in our work, I think we can all say we've seen that people don't have equal opportunities. Um, the system does fail people and it doesn't work and it's broken. So though we take a one-to-one -one approach, a person-centered approach, we also, if we're only working with the individual and then we send them back into society that um, is like a broken again, then we're only doing kind of part of our job. So this advocacy, for change is a big part of that work. Um, so then we get into the benefits of art therapy. And as you can see in a slide, they're just like everything, you can do, fix everything. <laughs> um, not, not really, but we'll kind of go into it. So it improves cognitive and sensory motor functions, fosters self-esteem, self-awareness, cultivates emotional resilience, promotes insight, enhances social skills, reduces and resolves conflicts and distress. So it's a really wide range of work and what that looks like in session can be really different. Um, it's very person-centered led. So even on a different day, it could be different depending on what that person is wanting to focus on, what that person is needing. But in general, it's using the language of symbols to express emotions and to relate and to connect. Um, so I personally take the approach that images kind of exist on their own. Um, we're kind of like a vessel that brings them into this kind of realm. So if we take that approach, then we have to talk about those images with respect. They have a right to be here. They have a right to be treated well. 
They have a right to safety. They have a right to their emotions. So the painting, the language we use is like the painting can maybe be angry. The painting can be hurt. The painting can have a voice. And what that does as well is that the painting doesn't just have to be this pretty thing that sits on the wall. It's made for something else. And it also doesn't have to relate to the person. So it can contain these emotions um, and the person doesn't have to be in, interweaven into those, so it's containment there. So that's just a bit about how I work. We're kind of gonna go into a little more as well and what that actually looks like. But first we'll kind of go back to um, our program and overall how this is coming together. Um, we are working to support the Rock Trust and their goal of ending youth homelessness, making it rare and non-recurring by in the health and well-being program, as I mentioned, supporting young people's mental health. So we're working towards young people feeling safe, secure, increasing resilience, and supporting them so they don't represent as homeless. So this is our team. We have four art therapists and one art therapy student placement. And we also have our um, peer mentor support. So we'll talk a little bit about that piece as well, our peer mentoring project. Um, and this is what we provide. So we provide peer mentoring, art therapy support, one-to-one -one support, wellness groups, staff training and advocacy. And we'll go into all those topics. So peer mentoring project, how this fits into our um, program. I apologize, you guys are noticing probably there's art in this presentation and that's all been made by young people in our program as well in our art therapy. Um, so at the, like, so our peer mentoring program, so it fits into our program with people who maybe are on our wait list, waiting for mental health access to support. Um, so then they can have some support while they're on that wait list. And it also can be supporting young people after their work is done with our one-to-one -one therapy support as well. So it can be kind of a transition um, back into the community. And then also our mentors, our peer mentors who have been through our program. So we're offering um, training for them, developing their employability skills and increasing confidence and self-esteem as well. So it's an exciting program, it's new for us. So it's just getting started and we're putting things into place, which of course COVID has been complicated, but getting there. Um, and so our art therapy program, we offer 12 sessions and we do a wellness assessment at the start, middle and end of our work, along with some goal-based outcomes as well. Um, but I put in here Bruce Perry's six R's that I thought we could talk about today. And I think this helps bring our work and what we're really doing a bit more into um, into light. So Bruce Perry developed a developmentally sensitive and neuroscience informed approach to supporting trauma, um, specifically people who have early childhood trauma. Um, and these are some of the six R's of the ways to work with that trauma. So when I'm going through them, um, please, you're welcome to add in the chat any examples that you have as well. Um, so I'll kind of explain them and give you some time to think about them and then we'll talk about your ideas as well. So the first one is relational. We talked about this a lot yesterday, right? So the number one R is relational. You can't really do any work until you have that safe space for the person. Um, in art therapy, they're not only relating to you, but they're relating to the artwork and the art materials as well. They're having a relationship there. Um, relevant, so developmentally matching where the individual is at, but also relevant to their life. Um, you know, Stephen's not with us today, but in our breakout room yesterday, he gave a really great example of um, helping a young person paint their new flat. So it's like spot on, how much more relevant can you get, right? <laughs> um, and I apologize while I'm sharing this, I don't know if I can see the the chat, if you guys are adding things in. Um, let me. Let's 
see. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that, actually. I don't think I can see the chat. <laughs> uh, it's no problem. There's uh, nothing in the chat at the moment, but I'll keep you posted if there's a, a question or something comes up. Okay, thanks, Avi. And you guys no can put in things. So if you ever are doing work with young people that you feel like is kind of relevant to where they're at, like painting um, their room or going for a, a walk with them, or like we talked about yesterday, learning the safe spaces in the city that's so relevant to their life. Um, repetitive. So in the next slide, you'll see one of those colorful mandalas um, that people kind of spend their time coloring in all the intricate shapes. Um, that's like a really great example of repetition. Um, kicking a soccer ball, you know, going back and forth and you get that like um, kick, 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 kick. That's a great example of repetition. And that kind of ties into this idea of like the peak experiences as well that I brought up before. So peak experience is kind of like when an artist or an athlete get into that zone and it's something very physical, right? You're doing something physical. It's normally a repetition, it might not be quite that, but it's like you're in the zone. So this kind of repetition, this pattern. Um, do you have any examples to share about repetition that you guys have posted? Not yet, but uh, feel free anybody to post uh, some of your examples from your own services in the chat box. Um, if you want to raise your hand and give an example, that's, um, that's possible too. So yeah, repetition can kind of, in painting, it could also be, you know, weaving or doing sewing, these kind of movements. Um, rewarding, at the end of the day, it has to be something that the young person finds pleasurable. So I think the painting of the walls is a really great example, right? Because at the end of the day, they can see like, this is my home and I made it, I made it a warm space and, in art therapy, what that rewarding can look like is um, creating a portfolio together. So at the end of the 12 sessions, we have pieces and we put them all up and people can see their actual journey through. And that can be really wonderful. And then they have something to take away with them as well. So that's very rewarding. Um, rhythm. So this is kind of that bilateral stimulation, right? So um, we sometimes do breath drawings with like both hands. If you're maybe listening to music while you're painting, playing the drums, um, anything that's kind of getting into that rhythm. So that bilateral movement. And then respectful, of course, it has to be something that is respecting the person and where they are and their culture and their background and their family. Um, and in that vein, I guess before I move on, does anyone want to share any of those ideas? Yeah, there's actually uh, a few in the chat box. So yeah. Lena, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself if you want to give the example that you shared. Uh, yeah. I'm going to buy young people struggles to regulate their emotions. So they have what we call a bottom brain box. And in that bottom brain box, quite a few things. He likes the um, poppy stuff that you have when you um, items are wrapped and sent in the post. So we all bring that in. And he likes to pop and pop and pop and pop. So he'll go to the box, he'll take that out. The thing he's got a tennis ball that he will um, repeatedly throw against the wall. Or if one of us is in the room, he'll throw it back and forth from us. So he kind of incorporates and he just naturally does it as well. One of the first signs that we know that he's agitated is body movement because he'll pace. Um, so he'll he'll find, he quite often will find someday and he'll pace around the room with you. And that's when we know we kind of go to the bottom brain box and try to do something that will help soothe him. Um, Paul, yeah, uh, you've also got another example in the chat box if you'd like to share. Uh, mine was just about uh, service time openings that they're consistently at the mm -hmm. same time, uh, seven days a week, not five minutes earlier or later, uh, because 
that offers a sense of containment to young people. Um, and it's key for staff to know, oh, we're running five minutes late. No, you need to have everything prepped and ready because the young people have developed a rhythm for themselves. Yeah, that's a great example. It's also kind of like relational, right? Like that's mm. that healthy relationship, that attachment, and then also respectful, respectful of the yeah. other person's time. Like some of our young people do have really busy schedules. They're working and like they, yeah, exactly. So it's just so many of the R's that you said there. And maybe just one last example for Maureen, if you want to unmute yourself and share your example from the chat box. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's really um, a really great thing to be able to write things down or draw things, you know, even if it's just scribbling. <clears throat> I, mean, I sometimes find if I'm kind of nervous or something, I'm kind of writing, uh, drawing little boxes and then filling them in and then drawing stars and all kinds of little silly things, but it just concentrates your mind and makes you less nervous. So I provide a wee notebook and a pen for every night stop guest. Because um, that's something they don't normally possess themselves. Um, so it's quite a cheap little thing to give them. Um, but it's really helpful to them because when they're in their room for the first time on their own in a stranger's home, it can be quite um, nervous. They can be quite nervous and anxious. So I sort of say to them, you know, write something down, draw a picture, do anything you like in your notebook, okay? write a poem, write down your feelings, you know, anything. And basically, they've said how much they enjoyed that little thing. It's like a one one ninety nine notepad and one of our pens, you know, and it's actually very, very helpful to them. So, yeah, I think it's, it's fantastic to do that kind of thing. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, thanks, Maureen. And that kind of, it goes into a lot of the hours, but definitely also rewarding as well, right? So at the end, like they have something tangible there. It's relevant because it's something that they're enjoying. Um, so I know that, you know, these are things that you, I'm sure you're doing also, and sometimes you might be aware of them, but it may be something as simple as like walking next to someone, you know, and, and not just going for a walk. Like I think um, Gaynor was saying, like pacing together, that's very rhythm oriented. So it's just, yeah, giving you credit because you're, you're doing them. And that's kind of what our work looks like as well. So, um, so yeah, so then talking also about um, relevance and respect. Not everyone wants to do art therapy and that is absolutely okay. They can still have support from us. We also offer this talk therapy support, which um, comes in the same format. It's 12 sessions. We do the assessment at the beginning, middle and end. And these are just um, some quotes from young people who have gotten support with us. Um, I can now describe who I am, strengths and personalities, and say that's me without hesitation. It's how I got through the week to keep me focused. Um, if I had a bad week, I knew I would have support during the week. And then we also offer group work as well, which I won't go into too much today. I think a lot of us have seen the benefits of group work um, and increasing that community support and decreasing loneliness and isolation as well. Um, and staff training as well. And then ending just with this advocacy part and that this is a big part of what we're doing and helping young people to give them a voice and representing them um, and partnerships. So yeah, I think that's, that's it for today. So thanks you guys. Great, thanks very much, Emma. Um, oh, perfect, just gonna ask if you could uh, and screen share. Okay, uh, if you have questions uh, for Emma, we can pull a few questions at the end of the three presentations. Um, but next, I'm going to pass the floor over to Heine from Finland. Uh, Heine is going to make you a co-host so you can share your screen if you want to join us. Um, Heine is going to talk to us about a project run in Finland called Sea Tribe. I think a lot of the times, particularly in Fianza, we look to Finland as an excellent example of how to design services around uh, combating homelessness as homelessness continues to drop in Finland. It's the only EU country where the numbers are going down. Um, Heine, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, perfect. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I couldn't hear or see you. <laughs> perfect. So, um, 
Well, I'll let you introduce the project yourself first. Um, I know you have a video that you want to share. Do you want to do an introduction first or do you want me to share the video first? Well, um, I'll introduce myself first and then we'll move on to the video. I'm Heini Kaasalainen and I worked as a manager in this Sea Tribe project, which ended a couple of months ago. So Heini, your um, screen is off. We can't yes. see you at the moment, or is your connection a bit poor? Mm. Just a moment. Okay, it, it doesn't seem to work. Can you now see my screen? I can see your screen, but uh, we can't. Uh, we can't see you. Um, and now you you're back. Me. Yeah, you're back. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. So yeah, um, the C Tri project ended a couple of months ago, and uh, I worked in in the project as a project manager with one colleague. So we were two in workers in the in the project. And um, yeah, maybe maybe we'll first see the video so you get a idea what we did during the three year period. And uh, during those 110 days at sea with almost 100 young persons who participated in the project. So please show us the video next. Oli vapaa kesäni niin päätin, että tartun hetkeen. Ja laittain chanssin päästä niin merille. Tulin Turkuun ja astuin ekan kerran Elenan kyytiin, niin mä olin vähän silleen, että ketä nämä tyypit on täällä. Ja mikä hemmeti kuoppa tässä on keskellä laivaa. Ja siihen me mentiin istuun, niin oli vähän sille ihmeissään. No nyt kun on ollut pari päivää Helenalla, niin ja arki tuntuu niin lomalta omasta elämästä, niin kuin nautin joka hetkestä. Koko reissu on ollut niin ihan mahtavaa ja ainut semmoinen fiilis on tällä hetkellä, että pelkää, että tämä loppuu tämä reissu. Täällähän kohtaa sille ihan päivittäin aika erilaisia haasteita. Se voi olla, että maata bikineillä siinä hellun kannella ja otetaan arskaa, kun meri vähän liplattaa. Tai sitten se voi olla, että, että köytetään itsemme keittiön kaiteeseen ja tiskataan silleen, että astiat tippuu. Siinä on niinku kaikki koetukselle. Et silleen tämä on niinku semmoinen turvallinen ympäristö kokea semmoinen elojäämiskamppailu. Sian sorkan tekeminen on mulla haaste. Yleensä joku toinen tyyppi on mua auttanut niissä Simonista selvinnä. Saa olla ihan oma itsensä täällä. Siis joka kertaa, joka päivä oppii uutta. Jos sulla on joku juttu, niin sä voit käydä kysyä hei, että miten tää meni, että voit sä auttaa tän solmunkaan. Ja... Komiikka täällä on se ykkösjuttu. Ei, ei ilman huumoria ei pärjää elämässä. Jos minulta kysytään, niin suosittelen kaikille, että tämä on sen verran hauskaa hommaa. Kuka on Meriheimolainen? Miten tästä tulee semmoinen tiimi? Miten tästä tulee semmoinen hyvä ryhmähenki? Mutta jotenkin vaan, kun me mennään sinne yhdessä ja me, me jaetaan sitä arkea, me jaetaan sitä seikkailua, niin se vaan, se vaan kasvaa. Ja sit sen purjeduksen lopussa, niin se on niinku vaan itsestään selvä, että se on me. Me ollaan sää ryhmä. Me ollaan tää jengi. Niin joka purjehduksen jälkeen mä oon ihan niinku vau. Wow, tää on ihan crazy. Ja et mä saan olla osa tätä.
Okay, um, I'll pass the floor back to you. Again, I need to do your presentation. After that little um, taster of what C-Tribe is. And I think you're muted. Okay, okay. perfect. Yes. I hope you saw also the texts <laughs> that sometimes I, I didn't. Um, mm -mm, how can I? Okay. No. <laughs> Sorry about this. This no I'm problem. Having trouble changing my slides for some reason. That's no issue. This happens. Um, this happens all the time. Uh, you sent me your presentation. If you want, I can um, I can bring it up. Okay, Let's great. That screen. would be that helpful. Would help. Perfect. Let's so we get on with this. <laughs> okay. No problem. Okay, I'm just bringing them up. Do you want to start by maybe introducing the project and I'll just bring up the slides? Yeah, the slide number three, I guess. Perfect. Great, that's it. Okay, so um, C Tribe was a project of uh, Y Foundation and Sail Trading Foundation, Finland, Finland, and our target group was young adults in the beginning of their independent life and more specifically they were um, for example residents of housing units uh, substance use and mental health rehabilitators uh, young adults who had experienced homelessness and so on almost everyone had some history of mental health problems. And at this point, it is important to uh, point out that everybody had other support, support also in their lives, for example, own social worker or psychologist and so on. So either me or my colleague are not mental health care professionals. And um, um, the methods used in projects were uh, sail training, adventure education, peers and service counseling, counseling. And the main object was personal development through sail training experience, learning by doing teamwork and finding new experience, new horizons in life and, and new friends. And uh, we hope that this would result in people moving on in their lives, going back to school, continue studies or entering working life, for example. And now you can change next. Thank you. So the C-Tribe model consists of three blocks, sale trainings, C-Tribe community, and along comes the service counseling, which is or was available all year round for, for all participants. Everybody took part in sailings and after that decided if this kind of activity was suitable for them. So everything was voluntary. The heart of the model is the, is the peer community, state tribe. Participants decided themselves what kind of wintertime activities were planned and implemented and they also evaluated activities themselves. And this, in my opinion, is very important. Um, many had years and years of experience of being a social service customer or patient, for example. And that has an impact on how, how a young person sees him, him or herself as a customer. And very often during sailings or other, other activities, we heard sentences like, I can't, I'm not able because of this or that or I don't know how to and all this being a reason not to try at all or give up uh, or, or 
view at this was that we didn't allow it, but instead offered a group of peers that helped and professional support if needed, but not ready solutions. And for example, during sailings, nothing was done for the participants. They did everything themselves. And when they realized their own power, it was a game changer for many. And uh, next slide, please. A couple of um, words of sail training, which I guess is not, uh, not familiar to, to everybody. So sail training is a method in which the main focus is not on sailing or navigation, but teamwork skills, self-knowledge and the development of social skills. And uh, if someone is interested, you can get to Sail Training International website through the link in the slide and find studies made on sail training more there. Um, we did all together 18 sailing trips that lasted from three days to 11 days in the Baltic and North Sea. And uh, during those sailings, nothing is done alone. All the tasks are done in autonomous small groups of three to five people, and they decide for themselves on the division of labor within that group. And these groups and participants are responsible for running everyday life on board. They cook food, clean, steer the ship, etc. So we, we don't have passengers, only crew members on board. And this uh, creates an atmosphere of being needed, important, and it builds up a sense of responsibility also. If and when someone was not able to run their duties for some reason, rest of the small group took over the task. Um, results were altogether surprisingly good. According to the service follow-ups and interviews we did during the project, this model builds up participant self-esteem and sense of ability, creates a strong community and sense of belonging somewhere. This was new for many, many of, of participants. And it also offers support in joint phases in life and in the beginning of independent life. And all this creates conditions where it's probably easier to move on in, in their lives, apply for a job or continue studies. And uh, Sea Tribe as a project ended uh, a couple of months ago, but luckily we get to continue the work in a new two year project funded by European Social Fund. And would, it will also be in cooperation with Y Foundation stuff and and a new partner Valovalmennos Yhdistys. There is still a lot to develop and uh, um, so we are quite happy for this new pro project which starts this month. Um, this was quite a compact presentation so if anyone has questions now, please ask, please ask, or if someone wants to discuss more about our results or, or other issues, don't hesitate to send me an email also later. It's also very fine, but, but now if someone has quick questions or something, comment, comments, please do. Um, I'm just taking a quick look in the chat box and I don't see any questions at the moment. Um, so if it's okay, I'm going to proceed to our third presentation. And again, if there are questions, we'll pull them and do them before we go to the coffee break. Um, so our next speaker, um, one moment, um, comes from Czech Republic, Katerina. Um, Katerina, I'm just going to make you a host so that you can um, share your screen. You can accept. Uh, Katerina works for Nadej, which is a, um, the only, I think, youth homeless organization in the Czech Republic. 
and um, what she's going to present is a series of um, two or three different practices they have within that service where they work on developing skills and relationships, confidence and self-esteem of some of the young people that they work with. Um, Katharina, the floor is yours. Hi. Hello. I try to share <laughs> my presentation. Okay. Perfect. We can see it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's Excellent. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katerina. Hello, I'm Katerina. I'm from uh, from Czech Republic, and I would like to present uh, our organization Nadeje. It means hope in translation. And Nadie is one of the largest organizations uh, in Czech Republic, which has been dedicated to helping people in need uh, for 30 years. And I work as a social worker in a day center for young homeless people in Prague. Sorry. So, uh, what are the young people we work with? But of, I'm sure you know young homeless people. But uh, in shortly, we work with people who are living in tents, uh, living in squats, and etc. Uh, these young people living institutional care for children, people without any background. These people with, without functional family, drug addicts, people with dual diagnosis, etc., and their ways of livelihood is occasionally short-time work, searching the trash cans, prostitution, and thefts. So, uh, our organization, our center provides these services: uh, low threshold services, social services, and leisure activities. Uh, the Center for Young Homeless People provides basic services which these young people need daily. Uh, we provide food, drink, clean clothes and laundry, hygiene and mostly help with communication with the authorities. So uh, this is uh, low threshold services. Uh, of course, we provide social counseling, but this presentation is focused on leisure activities. Uh, work with uh, young homeless people is uh, for us is long-term process. We are improving uh, our services by socio-therapeutic projects, projects and leisure time activities. Some of which we organize weekly, some of, some of which we organize as a weekend trip outside Prague. We organize regularly a cooking session where several young people learn how to cook on their own. This uh, course is taught by one of the social workers from our center, and it's uh, informal. Uh, and they are also weekly juggling uh, and circle session, which are focused on physical improvement and concentration. However, uh, we consider weekend trips most important, uh, helping these young people improve in a lot of ways of everyday life. And we organize uh, hero's journey trips, social circles, and trips to the nature. So I will start with social circles. What is social circles? Circus is a modern tool for working with disadvantaged young people uh, who have a lot of energy and are trying to concentrate it. First part is to create a consistent group where all the members respect each other. Uh, then they learn some circle skill depending on their abilities. Uh, for example, juggling, uh, partner acrobatic, balance techniques, and handstand, etc. Uh, the key term here is creativity. These young people were really led to creative activities, while here they are really, really creating their own story using circus techniques. Yeah. This process creates respect within the group and individual self-esteem where all the participants learn stuff which at the beginning they claim will never manage to do. Uh, our trips in uh, our center, we started with social circles two years ago. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, the social circles trip uh, lasts for three days. Uh, it's 
for about 10 people. Uh, then I was, I it was difficult to meet on a regular uh, se rehearsals session. So we an organized another trip just for four young people who really wanted to create their own performance. And during these three days, we have created a performance step by step. It was really difficult, <laughs> but uh, oh, uh, it, it was awesome. With this show, we went to the Error Festival. It's an international festival, homeless theaters in Bratislava, and they performed their first performance. This, this picture from stage uh, from Bratislava. So key, key term uh, here is cooperation. Uh, all members respect each other. Uh, etc. So, next activity is Hero Journey. Uh, short, uh, we work with the model of Hero Journey by Brett Stephenson. Uh, Brett is an, is an American psychologist who works with high risk youth in USA. According to his model, the youth lacks the transitional rituals and lacks the men idle model and young boys are usually raised by mother. Uh, it was a clear border between childhood and adulthood to, through transitional rituals. If you pass the exam, you belong uh, among adult with all of the adv adv advantages and disadvantages. Uh, if you didn't pass the exam, you are still a child or you are dead uh, because uh, the exam could have been extremely difficult. Uh, the young people today lack these rituals, because, be, uh, but they need uh, the adventure, danger experience, situation, etc. So they started abuse drugs. Uh, Brad Stephenson organized a few trainings of the hero's journey in the Czech Republic as well. Our hero's journey is a four-day trips under supervision of experienced lecturers who led the young people through a journey of themselves. It's a journey to their past, present, and future, so they can think and talk about it, contemplate about their lives, trying to point out the bad experience and work with it. The most important is their openness and the act of sharing their experience, on which we can later work more deeply. We try to create safe and confident environment. It's necessary uh, that lectures were really experience it because we work with emotion and people return to complicated memories, relationship, etc. from the from their past. Uh, during four days, the young people get to know the concept uh, of hero's journey. It's a circle. Uh, at the beginning, it's a challenge to learn something, new personal experience, and uh, they have to deal with obstacles. Important thing is finish the whole circle uh, and task community benefits. This circle is the basic of our whole life, challenge, obstacles, virtue and your friends on the, our journey and community benefits. We also work with various techniques, for example, imag imag imagination, work with wood, plaster, uh, etc. We make our, our talisman, mask, and last day we, me, we meet by the fire and share our personal experiences. And then we threw our challenge or wish into the fire. Uh, our shadow is full, but we still have some time for common, common cooking, dining, and sharing, etc. Uh, it's an important thing is. Uh, create a safe space for contemplation and etc. I, I think in presentation is here some key words. So the third activities uh, are trips to the nature. Uh, with these trips, our center started 10 years ago. They were spontaneous trips to the nature or trips to the cultural monuments. It was attended about 10, 15 young people and they were without backpack, without sleeping bag, etc. Equip, equipped only with enthusiasm of my colleagues and young people. Over time, we asked our donors to buy sleeping bags, backpacks, tents, etc. And we have created some rules for these trips. 
Now we organize uh, the trips outside Prague to experience pure nature and to make physical activity. It's usually a trip to world with hiking, climbing, bouldering and adventure of this kind. We have also been on trips with canoe or raft on the river. Young people experiencing uh, overcoming the, ob the obstacles, unpleasant weather, fatigue, displeasure, and to get together with us, lecturer as a social worker, and we try to overcome together <laughs> with smile on our faces. Important is their feeling they that they are they overcome themselves. So key terms is cooperation, rise of self-esteem, discovering our personal sources. So princip principles of our leisure activities. Uh, these trips last for three, four days maximum, and there are around 10 young people, two, two professional lecturers focus on the aim of the trip and two social workers. All the participants, including lecturers and social workers, stay under one roof and everyone participates in all basic everyday activities like preparing meals, cleaning, uh, etc. This trip have certain schedule, but in the meantime, it's rather informal. So the barriers among all participants are being taken down. Uh, important things is participant must be able to be drug to be drug free. <laughs> it's so our experience, uh, uh, our I I mean uh, social worker. <laughs> It's an opportunity to get to know each other in a new situation, uh, opportunity to learn something new, to meet new people. And uh, our professional lecturers can represent positive idols or model for young people. It's very important. Closer relation with our young people because we are on the same level, uh, gaining more trust. It's very necessary for, for, for this work, uh, gaining more self-confidence. And they have chance to do various ordinary activities, such as cooking, chopping wood, etc., for other people. And uh, finding out that I, I do not belong here, it could be motivation to be changed because uh, we get to know the young uh, man who lost uh, his family, tragical way, and he lived in the street for six months. And he realize, re, realized uh, during the hero's journey that he is able to go to the, to work and he's able to uh, live in apartment, etc. And he was a dancer of Latin American dance, dances uh, at junior European championships. So, and our experience, uh, <laughs> next, our, our, our clients uh, have a low responsibility and motivation of participants, addiction of our clients on drugs. It's uh, hard to work with this difficult concentration and we never know how many people will attend our trips and uh, personal borders of social workers, uh, especially in hero journey. It could be difficult to participate with our young people on the same topic. Uh, ev everyone of us has to find his own way how to be open and authentic uh, because our own journey of our inner hero can be very emotional for us too. And it's, uh, pro it could be a problem. And uh, so, experience of our lectures. Uh, they get to know people who they will never meet before. And they are realizing how many negative experiences they pass and how many obstacles they should overcome. The, the determination to do everything. Uh, it means our, our young people uh, and uh, surprise of openness, the willingness to active engage. So I think it's more. 
uh, experience of our clients, uh, possibility to change the way of life for a while, relax from their difficult way of life, relax from drugs, uh, to know something new, some new people, lecture skills, uh, to know something new about themselves, possibility to feel like a normal person, person. And they say it's difficult to keep attention on the work all day uh, and uh, new experiences from theater. And now we uh, making a short uh, movie. So it's, that, it's a really interesting experience for them. So summary, <laughs> social workers and young people can create better and strong, stronger relationship we can be certain support in their lives, realization they have some adult by their side. Uh, seven of the, the young people already have their training accommodation or, and this is important step in their lives. Almost all of them contacted their families. It's a big change. Their experience it's created ability to overcome obstacles in the trips. They overcome shyness and go to the stage uh, in theater with performance uh, and experiences success. And the so this is sentence uh, of our young woman. Uh, when you have an accommodation, everything just begins. So this is the end. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, I'm just going to take the spotlight off and thank you for ending the share screen. I mean, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, and in particular, I think, uh, thank you for sharing some of the perhaps disadvantages and the challenges that you face as well. Because um, I think often when we're presenting these practices, um, a lot of the time we talk about them as if they're really easy to do and they work all the time perfectly and often that's not the case and there are many challenges so I think it's it's quite good to get an insight into some of those and it also will bridge us into the breakout rooms that we'll be doing after the coffee break where we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the reality that a lot of services are working within and what some of the challenges are um for you, um, I don't think I've seen any questions come up in the chat box. I just think it's been mostly um, thanks to our speakers and to be able to get an insight into different services that are out there, whether it's art therapy in Scotland, sailing trips in Finland, or the um, social circus and uh, trips to nature in Czech Republic. I think there's plenty of different services that we can look to. I'm going to break now for the coffee break. Um, actually, I think we're pretty much, you know, we're a little bit over, over time, but let's aim to come back um, in 10 minutes. So if we say 10 past the hour, whatever time zone you're in in Europe at the moment, um, and then I'll break us out into breakout rooms. What I might ask everybody to do is if you, if you know there are other people from your organization on the call, you can put in your organization name um, within your own name on your on how your name is displayed on Zoom. That way, when I'm breaking out the groups, we can make sure that you're not uh, in a breakout room with five of your colleagues. Um, but if you're here on your own and there's no one else in your organization, there's no need to do that. Otherwise, I'll see you all in about 10 minutes. Um, enjoy the coffee break.
You're on mute, Robbie. I can't hear you. Thanks, Maureen. Sorry, I uh, I had my microphone on mute. <laughs> um, no, I was just saying, if you're back in the room, you can um, turn back on your webcam so we can see who's here or who is still out having um, coffee or tea break or whatever it is they need to get through uh, this morning. What we're going to do now is break out into uh, breakout rooms for about 40 minutes. Um, and the idea here is to have a bit more of an informal conversation to get people talking about what are some of the challenges that they're facing and uh, maybe building on a little bit of what are some of the practices that either you've seen today or some of the topics that were discussed yesterday, maybe like strengths based approaches uh, or pie and how can we integrate them in a more practical sense into services that we're delivering. Um, I'm going to break us out into workout rooms now so we'll do that for about 40 minutes. We'll have the idea boards links again, which is just a way to collect main ideas, topics, challenges that are discussed. And um, I'll be in one work, uh, one breakout room, Dama will be in the other, and then we'll come back at the end um, to have maybe an informal debrief and to just have a bit of a check in with um, key topics that were discussed. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is create the breakout rooms. You should all in the next few moments receive a, um, a notification and then we'll get started. There should be something coming up on your screen at the moment. I think everybody who's left in this room should be assigned to a breakout room. Um, so you can go there in your own time when you're ready. Okay, hello again, everyone. Um, maybe it might just be worth um, quickly introducing one another. There might be a few people who don't know each other yet um, from the calls. Um, my name is Robbie Stakespam. I obviously work for Fiance. You probably all know me at this point. Um, I lead in our work on youth homelessness and I'm going to pass the floor uh, for an introduction to Paul. And what I'd ask is each person can then pass the floor to somebody else to do a quick uh, introduction. Yeah. Hi, I'm Paul Kelly. I manage youth services for Focus Ireland here in Dublin, predominantly um, a drop-in centre similar to Katarina's in Czechoslovakia, no, Bulgaria, uh, I get it. and I also manage an under-18 service for um, children who cannot be placed by the state, um, which is quite a height, an extremely low threshold service for, for complex cases. Um, outside of work, I'm also a psychologist, not in work. Oh, uh, Emma, you're beside me. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm um, an art therapist and a health and well-being worker at the Rock Trust. And um, we work with young adults who are ages um, 16 to 25 who are at risk or experiencing homelessness. Um, and I'll pass it to Carlo, you're, be you're beside me. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I, I work in Trento, it's a, a city in Italy, in the north. I'm a social worker and uh, I work in a night shelter for adult people. And uh, yeah, I work for a, a church foundation. So the, okay, uh, maybe Damien, okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Damien Bogers. I'm a social worker and a sub coordinator of a housing first program in Brussels, uh, which is specialized in the from uh, 18 to 25 years old uh, homeless people. Uh, so that's it. And I'm passing 
it to Hator. Uh, Hator, you're on mute. Sorry, I apologize. I apologize. No problem. <laughs> Uh, um, my name is Hector. I'm a psychologist. At the moment, I'm working in Brighton Health Council. I'm learning disability assessment and I'm, I'm voluntary in a network, Frontline Just Life in Brighton, to support the young and adult people performing for mental health and mental issues. Uh, I'm passed to Mandarina Cristina, I think she's Italian. Hi, my name is Cristina Morandini. Nice to see you. Um, I work for Caritas in Udine, so in North uh, East Italy. I work uh, as an educator uh, in um, a residence where um, uh, we are making a co-housing experience for people of all ages. At the moment, uh, we have people from uh, uh, 30, to 68 years old. And um, we have uh, um, uh, alcohol uh, problems and uh, mental issues. This is my experience. Thank you. And uh, I pass it to, wait a minute. Mm. I don't see other uh, people who are... Two people left. I think you've got Katharina and Kira. Okay, so I'll pass it to Katharina. Thank you. I'm Katharina. I'm from Prague, from Czech Republic. And I work with uh, young homeless people. Uh, I work as a social worker and leader of our day center for young homeless people. And I work uh, with uh, homeless people for 15 years uh, and uh, with young homeless people for six years. And uh, that's it. And Kiara, please. Hi, uh, I'm Kira. Sorry, my camera isn't working at the minute. Uh, that may improve as I go along. Uh, but I work with Housing First uh, in Edinburgh, delivering services to Caselet. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I'm... My computer keeps muting me after I unmute myself. I think I'm okay now. Um, I'm just going to put a link into the chat box to idea boards. And this is just a way to, I mean, what we want to do is to keep this conversation quite informal and just to try and capture some of our experiences around working on things like mental health, well-being, self-esteem, confidence building of young people experiencing homelessness within our services. Um, but the idea with the idea boards is it's just a way, if you click on the link, to kind of give us a bit of a framework to have these conversations. Um, I'm quite happy to kind of take a back seat here, listen to some of the things that you're talking about and to put them into um, put them into the boxes and to try and map like what are some of the challenges and the barriers that you face as service providers, uh, what does work, what doesn't work in each of your contexts. Um, I don't know, I think maybe it could be interesting as a starting point to maybe talk about some of the disadvantages and challenges that Katerina mentioned in her presentation. Um, so I noted them quite quickly, but Katerina, you mentioned uh, sometimes participants have low levels of responsibility and motivation, and uh, there's addiction problems, they have difficulty concentrating, um, you don't know whether how many young people will attend, will they definitely attend, how do you set personal boundaries between staff and social workers and the young people, um, and then some other uh, risks associated with the group. Um, does anybody have similar experiences of, of those challenges, first of all, um, or ways that they have overcome some of those challenges? I think we've definitely, especially the not knowing how many people are going to attend a group. I was like really inspired by your presentation and by um, the sailing 
of having like a closed group where people were attending all of them. We just haven't been able to do that. We always have to have them open because uncertainty. And is there a way that you've managed to get more of a routine going with young people or is it just that as a as a solution you have a kind of a more open door policy to these types of programs? Um, yeah, I think, well, I came into this role right before lockdowns, so of course, that's affected everything as well. Um, but I know from the team, it's always been an issue. So they've always done them open groups. We are trying this summer because we've partnered with a number of workshop, um, sculpture workshops. So we're doing a sculpture group and it's gonna be six weeks. So we're gonna try it to be a closed group where we ask people to come for all six. Of course, if they can't make it, if something happens, it's understandable, but just to set that intent. So we're going to try it um, because of the nature of the work where you're creating a piece the next time you're firing it, the next time you're glazing it. Um, so yeah, but we're taking the approach of doing a lot of prep work with the young people, like meeting them multiple times before the group starts to really prepare them and engage them. But I don't know if anyone has any other ideas of how to go about it. But we would be very open to suggestions. Um, we would do a lot of group work, but we'd leave it as open groups. Um, I think there's two things going on that needs to come onto the table. So youth homelessness is, um, I tend to say we are a youth service and the young people happen to be homeless, not the other way around, because we need to change our mindset. Um, you can't work with young people. It's even, even the age group there. When we, uh, last year we commissioned LGBT research in Ireland and the definition of youth is 18, depending on your funder. And we probably need to widen it out as well up to 30 because the, the brain works differently. Um, so I think there's a nuance change that probably needs to happen in terms of discussions. Um, so we would definitely say we're a youth service and the youngsters happen to be homeless. So that's the first one we do. That attracts youth workers in, not people who predominantly work in homeless services who want to fix people. Um, th then in terms of the, so taking that principle of youth work, participation, we try and get the, um, the motto is your service, your voice. So we try and have the young people develop an out, this is what we want. Now sometimes the team, uh, the, the deputy manager comes to me with ideas and I'm going, Jesus, help me. Because what they want to do it, sometimes is quite fierce. But I, we don't stop people. Um, we also get them to pay, so they'll contribute. Like it might only be a euro, but they will still pay for group activities if we're going off kayaking or stuff like that. And we do a lot of graffiti work. Um, so the service has artwork from graffiti and it's always around, uh, we do th about three projects a year of graffiti. Uh, and even though it's COVID, we're planning another one. Uh, and that's all around words that the young people give us. We, we've also done projects where we hand them cameras and say, go around the city and tell us what is your, tell us the story of your life. So it's not about what staff want to do. I think that's the key thing. It's what young people want to do. Um, and it's how you manage that tension. Um, and the boundaries piece uh, that, that, that Katarina talks about, I think is important as well. Like there's ways of working where you say, you can share, but you don't leave, you don't leave yourself vulnerable um, because young, the young people we work with are hurt and they will seek to hurt, like hurt people hurt, as I always say. So they'll either hurt themselves or hurt you. Um, so and one of the things we do is we, we, in youth services, the ones I manage, we constantly work through a book actually called Professional Boundaries in Social Care. And that's where the staff read a chapter and it comes in for discussion. So it's, it's live. It's not just a discussion um, at interview, how's your boundaries? It's a live practice that happens monthly, if that makes sense. It's akin to reflective practice, but it's a, it's in addition to reflective practice. Hey, Paul, could you repeat the name of that book? I'll send you the link. 
Okay, perfect. We can send it around afterwards. There's a PDF on the web, on the internet. But the idea is that all staff kind of come together once a month as a way yeah. to review how they are it's setting like boundaries. Club. Yeah. It, it, it's not to review how they're setting boundaries, it's to actually get them to reflect on what boundaries are. Because if you look at it from a therapeutic perspective, um, and I don't mean that everybody's a counselor, but looking at interactions can be therapeutic. Uh, we need boundaries because they contain people. It's about that, uh, the, the R's of Perry. It's about offering safe, contained, consistent services. It's not like I'm a member of staff having a bad day today, and therefore you're going to have a bad day. So it's about it's our, our awareness. It's our own self-awareness. It's bringing all that to the table. Now you need to mute me, Robbie. <laughs> uh, would somebody else like to jump in then, um, either with one of the challenges that they've uh, found based on maybe something Emma or Paul has shared from Katerina's presentation or something totally different altogether? You don't all have to jump in at once. Or maybe there's a practice within your service that you find works quite well, like Paul mentioned, the artwork, graffiti, projects, kayaking. Uh, Emma mentioned some of the stuff that they're doing with the um, Edinburgh Sculpture Studio. Are there other practices that you have that you find works quite well with young people? I was going to ask Katarina about the drugs. You mentioned four days, uh, potentially alcohol and drug free, or you mentioned drug free. Um, how did people respond to that if, if it's a low threshold service to be four days without substances? So, sorry, uh, uh, you mean... Uh, uh... I, I'm I'm not sure if I understand your question. Uh, uh, you mentioned it for the groups um, that people had to be four days uh, drug yes. free, uh -huh. um, and I know that always presents a challenge to us in terms of what's the what's our tolerance level. And I, I think the thinking we have is as a group is once you're not falling around the place and that you're safe to walk into the building, we will allow someone into the service to participate. However, we do stress to people that we might ask them to leave because there could be people, it's a mixed group, so there could be some people in recovery and that might trigger stuff. So it's a fine balance um, between a mixed, being a low threshold service and, and having people who don't take drugs, people who do take drugs and people who are thinking about it. Yeah, uh, I, I talk, talked uh, about uh, our trips because uh, we can't to take uh, with us uh, people who uh, used uh, hard drugs. Mm. Yeah, of course, alcohol and uh, weeds and uh, it, uh, it's uh, okay for us, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but we have, uh, we have uh, experienced that uh, it's maximum four days uh, for it's it's okay for the people because uh, five five today uh, it's uh, they are uh, no concentrate concentrated yeah. and uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's very bad <laughs> for everyone for uh, for for young people for us and for lecturers and it, it four days it's great it's for it's it's our experience <laughs> yeah oh, no 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 that's good to know uh, Damien, I was wondering from the Housing First for Youth experience in Belgium, um, do you, how do you engage with young people within the service? Um, can you be more specific in your question? So once you have um, young people who are housed within the Housing First for Youth project, are there particular activities that you do to engage with them on mental health, um, 
or is it more that they come whenever they have a problem or do you kind of have more active ways of um, engaging with them? Okay, so we have uh, um, uh, three branches, the, the three action. The first one is uh, all the uh, admi administrative work, uh, the housing work, uh, the paperwork and, and everything that we, uh, the e educators also do with the social workers. Um, the second one is uh, projects that, um, that is specific because it's uh, the project is uh, only for the housing first programs, but it combines the all the others uh, housing first projects in Brussels. So uh, in in Belgium, it's not uh, state wise. You know, it's uh, GNOs uh, who takes the responsibility of running the housing first programs. And uh, so uh, the idea was coming all the um, uh, resident and the housed. Uh, people uh, together uh, to to make um, activities. Uh, so once in a month they got a meeting so to discuss and to organize the activities they want to do. Uh, and uh, once a month they do the activity they 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 have planned. So that's the second branch. The third branch is uh, before that we already uh, have um, observed that there uh, were a big lack of uh, activities and uh, a sense of uh, I think uh, loneliness in our uh, in our uh, beneficial people. Um, uh, so we made uh, ourselves uh, without any um, uh, boundaries or any structure. We um, we, we we thought that uh, it was a good idea to make uh, also not group uh, activities but uh, individual activities. And so we uh, we decided to make uh, three uh, activities in our housing first pr program. Uh, one is for uh, cooking at home, because we got one educator who's also a, 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 a former cook chef, and so uh, he can make a lot about uh, what's the gastronomy, what's what's eating, what's dieting, what's uh, what's cheaper to buy uh, uh, outside or to cook by by your yourself, etc. Uh, the second uh, branch was uh, given to the uh, sport uh, activities. And uh, the third one uh, was based on the cultural and also uh, painting sessions. So that's the things that we made ourselves without any structures. And uh, then we we we've seen that it was me making. It's it's hard to to make the appointment with the people to be sure that they will be there. But way, when they there, it's when they, they, they've made the step, uh, my observation is that it's already won. It's already uh, a win, win situation. And do you find, I wonder, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure what you were doing before the Housing First Youth Project, but do you find that once you are working with a young person in housing first for youth because they're already housed that it's easier to maintain that relationship with them versus i'd imagine for somebody like um, paul who's working in a night shelter perhaps it's more difficult to sustain yeah. that type of relationship that once they're in the house there's you're almost on a trajectory that's quite clear yeah yeah of course uh um um, most of all, with the the, the Brussels uh, house uh, um, night shelters, 
um, uh, nothing is certain if you're uh, if you're a, um, a man on the street. Uh, your night is never uh, conducted the night after. So every day is uh, like um, uh, an attempt to get a room, to get a place to sleep. And so it, it gives a instant in instantaneity of the needs that uh, we really can't uh, uh, do something else uh, but uh, to clear the problem with people in housing. Also, for the people in housing, my observation is uh, to let also the resting time and not uh, put pressure when they get to housing. So when they get to housing, uh, they sometimes feel like uh, uh, we want them to do a lot of things. We want them to find the work. We want them to uh, communicate with their families. And uh, we, we say, oh, come on, uh, uh, may, make it a pause. Uh, we, we give you two months just to settle down, just to have a new uh, day rhythm just to to find uh, 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 have the occasion to to make the contacts with uh, old uh, old friends or something and then we're gonna have to we, we we're going to talk about what you want to do what is about your future but um, the resting time is also really important and i could i come to you maybe i don't know what the parameters of um your work is with the Rock Trust, but I know that you have Housing First for Youth projects as well. And so do you see a difference between working with young people who are already housed versus young people who might still be sofa surfing or looking for accommodation? And how do you, what do you think are the different uh, challenges that people face and how do you meet them as a service provider? Uh, the, the comparison between the uh, young who are housed and uh, who are housed and well, I was actually asking the question to Emma um, from the Rock Trust um, because their service has both Housing First for Youth and uh, other services. So I think it'd be interesting to hear how they meet the different needs of young people. Yeah, I think I think what you said is really true. Um, so like in therapy, um, if someone's couch surfing and sofa surfing and um, or even staying in a hostel that where they're not necessarily comfortable. A lot of our focus is gonna be around um, containing resilience and stabilization. And it's really expected that they're not gonna be able to make every session. A lot of times they'll call up and say they didn't sleep well or things like that. And just the fact that they call to cancel, I always think is like, uh, like you were saying, Damien, that's a win. If they're gonna call me and cancel, then they're engaging still. Cause at that point their life is pretty chaotic. And then I think also what you said, Damien, with like the rest time is so true as well. So the, a lot of our young people, once they get into the permanent housing, either housing first or council housing, um, it does take a little bit of time for them to get settled and get into their routines and their rituals. But then afterwards, a lot of the engagement of therapy is a lot deeper and we're diving into maybe like more of the past trauma, the history. Um, they're kind of ready to engage with that. Um, and also their focus is a lot more on their future. Like they're like exactly what you're saying, Demon, they're not able to, when they're not in a stable housing situation, um, they're not able to really think about their, their job or their continuing education. Um, and a lot of times, I mean, not everyone, some people are, and that's absolutely wonderful when they are, but a lot of times they can feel really overwhelmed by that and feel like it's so out of reach. And it really just it does just take a few months. And then suddenly it's like, oh, actually those things are more um, exciting to talk about and not as scary and things like that. And so just kind of holding that for them that it's okay to be scared, it won't won't feel like that forever, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I would say we see a, a really a large difference and it's really nice to get to work with someone throughout that process, I would say. We offered those 12 sessions, but it's an open door policy. 
so they can come back and do another set of 12 at any point, so. And can I ask um, maybe one of the participants who hasn't had a chance to speak yet, um, Hedor, Kira, or Gaynor, um, are there particular challenges that you're finding uh, in your own services and how you engage with young people that you'd like to share? Or if there is a particular practice or something that you think is working quite well that you'd like to share? Um, for our model, uh, just again, housing first, uh, but I find it quite helpful with young people that we can work one-to-one. -one. Uh, what we tend to do is, um, especially these kind of activities and going out to do things, it's been limited through lockdown. Um, but I think it helps people engage if they can meet with a worker on their own terms at their flash, ash, wherever they're staying and, and go along with company. Um, and I found it quite helpful to be able to tailor that to an individual on a really broad scale. Um, we run something called a Make It Happen Fund, where if a client will contribute a small amount, you know, and it can be as, as little as a pound even, um, we will then pick up and, and fund the rest to do an activity or something that they otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to do. Uh, and we've had really good take up on that, getting people to plan the things that they'd like, how to organize it, how we're going to go about it, how we're going to fund it, all of this. Um, it's been a great opportunity to to get people really doing what they want to do and, and really making the most of support. And can I ask what kind of um, things do young people bring to the Make It Happen project? Oh, we've done all sorts. Uh, most recently, I had a guy who is big into his music. Uh, and so we ended up hiring a recording studio for him. Uh, and did a session on that. Uh, we've got another client who is wanting to go away for the weekend. Uh, and obviously with lockdown, we've been limited, um, but that's something we're looking at, at trying to plan and possibly even planning one of us to go with him to provide support for us. Um, but yeah, lockdown has limited that. So we'll see how that one goes. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally understand, but even to do something like the recording studio is amazing. Um, I think one thing that's interesting that you really touched on is the importance of one-to-one -one work. I think a lot of the practices that we've heard um, earlier were really around doing group activities and bringing people in together and forming kind of relationships and a sense of community. Um, within your project, how important is that balance between the two? And having one-to-one uh, -one work as well. Sorry, I couldn't unmute the... Um, no we do the vast, vast majority of our work is one-to-one. -one. Uh, our clients would very, very rarely interact with each other in the course of receiving support from Housing First, though quite a lot of them will know each other outside. Um, where we tend to interact with groups would solely be if I am going with a client uh, to support them to join another services group. Um, but I, I find that quite helpful even to have that familiar face going into some of these groups, it, it just takes the pressure off a little. Um, I had a guy recently wanting to engage with a smart recovery group and was really anxious about it. So we went along and I sat with him at the back of the room for the first 20 minutes and we'll just sit here and we'll watch together. And then gradually, gradually facilitated him to engage with the rest of the group and then build those relationships and slowly start them to step back. Um, I like being able to blend it like that. You're, you're really integrating somebody into a community via the Housing First support. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, I can see you've your hand raised. Yeah, it's just something that uh, Kira triggered there in terms of one-to-one. -one. I think one of the things we forget around young people is they don't have the emotional language or literacy, uh, um, probably because of developmental trauma or other incidences of neglect. Um, so in terms of therapeutic work, actually in terms of just surviving life, one of the jobs that we've found and we do with young people is scaffold them in, in, emotionally. So we need to give them the language. We often need to tell people you are angry because the job of a parent is to actually model those things. So it, it's, and it's one of the, the reasons why young people enjoy one-to-one -one work, but then I would be quite cautious that somewhere in there you need to move it into a social um group environment because we know that uh, one we're social beings and if we stay isolated like what the largest reason for falling back into homelessness once you're housed is actually social isolation 
Um, so we have to be very careful. It's a, it's a fine balancing act. But notice your head, Robbie, <laughs> nodding with almost surprise around the music studios. We do that on a regular basis. That's because it's youth work. And I think this is the key thing. We do youth work, not homeless work. So that's why you need to move. So if you look at what happens in youth services, this is their bread and butter. And I think that's the thing that needs to come into homeless services. And I've had that tension in our organization for years. Um, people come, oh, have you got, you know, homeless? And I go, no, we're a youth service. This is a youth center that happens to have young people who are homeless. And it's holding that tension. Um, and it is a tension that has to be held. And if you do that, then you start to think like youth workers not homeless workers. So you, you, uh, as Damien was saying, you know, young people, they're used to this. I need to fill out forms. I need to do this. I need to tell my story 10,000 times. No, you don't. Sit there, relax, throw the feet up. Um, let's order a pizza. Uh, I think that's the thing that, need, that would be useful in terms of spreading a message. This is, you do youth work. Can I ask, what would you say oh, is rant. the big difference between a service that's youth work driven versus homelessness driven? You don't view the thing as a problem. Okay. Homelessness tends to see everything as an issue and a problem that has to be fixed. And if you start coming from the mentality of fixing, you there's two things within that. One is you attract a certain style of people who go, I'm going to fix you, um, which is very much around when you're trying to introduce pie or trauma informed work, things like that. Uh, organizations will lose staff because they're going, oh, I'm not, this, this business of empowering people, I'm not into that. Whereas youth work is really, it, it's, it's more of a phenomena. It's about co-creating, it's co-facilitating. You do see the, the youngster as an equal. Um, I, I've said it, and you've heard me say this before, Robbie, I have never in 25 years got someone out of homelessness, ever. They do it themselves. I completely agree with Paul on that. Uh, I've worked in quite a number of different homeless services at this stage. I like to say that I work in housing, not homeless, uh, mm. because I think it builds that sense of identity. Otherwise, I've, I've had this with clients moving into new tenancies, still referring to themselves as, as homeless. It's well, and or actually, organizations referring done. to them as homeless. <laughs> and it, it's so, it boxes people in. Um, and I think that's an issue, not just dealing with young people going through homelessness, but system wise, we need to start looking at building somebody's identity as, as a person, as opposed to a label, as opposed to where they're sleeping. Yeah, a lot of our young people don't consider themselves homeless. Like, that's why we are trying, we have to also reword, we're thinking about rewording how we talk about it, but our young people don't consider themselves to be homeless. So. Yeah, I mean, as an organization, uh, or at least personally, we've moved more like to saying people experiencing homelessness rather than young homeless people uh, to try and kind of break that identity. Carlo, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, yeah. I just want to, to say I, I agree with Paul. Um, I work in a shelter, so with the homeless people. Anyway, we 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 do we do not try to fix anyone. We we just work on relationship and uh, our shelter uh, give opportunity to thirty days or sixty days for uh, resident people. But I also see the problem with young people with uh, a lot of problem with drugs or uh, family. And uh, I, I, I saw that they, they really don't fit with a shelter like ours. So it's really a different problem, I think, a different uh, work with young people is really different, in my opinion. But the problem also in Italy is that when you are 18 year old, then you are adult. So, so I'm for this reason. I I'm, I'm also curious to understand how young people, for example, arrive in a rock trust. On so, thank you. 
maybe before Emma comes back in and that I can just see where we've got maybe about two or three minutes left and Gaynor I feel like you put on your webcam and raised your hand uh, a few speakers ago so if you'd like to come in I mean I just think I, I would probably echo a lot of what's already been said I really do um, agree with kind of Paul's mentality around that um, it's youth work um, and how if we don't approach it in that manner and have that mindset around it that we are going to have um, colleagues that want to fix a young person or colleagues that don't understand the value system that people have grown up with or their, their, their world. I mean, going back to yesterday with one of the presentations, it was about meeting the person at their point in their world on their terms and them leading it. And I think a lot of what's been shared today about um, whether you're doing one-to-one um, -one work and then progressing into supporting the young person, um, going into group work and that socialization. It's just literally about meeting people at their point where they are in their lives. Um, and that I kind of think is reflected in whether you're supporting a person who's in a house project such as ours or sofa surfing, you know, it, it's about respecting where a person is at. So I, I just, everything that people have said, they, yeah, I'm on board with. Beth Rothschild, if you've ever heard of her, she works with developmental trauma, says, step into the client's world, but keep one foot in your own world. So you, we need to stay grounded, but step in to their world. Can you so say that? Who is that? Out. Who's the person but, again, um, Paul? Babette Rothschild. Roth, yeah. Okay, the psychologist, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think she that's does a lot good. of body work. What was that, Gainer? I didn't say anything. I just, oh. I do agree with, I, I agree with that, you know, I mean, I've got a casting background, so that being with a person and one foot in their world and one foot out, and that's yeah. um, helicopter approach as well, you know, looking the big picture and I, I think that's the thing that we don't understand that person's world and we're never going to we've just got to respect sure I hardly understand my own world the of the <laughs> where they lead us exactly <laughs> uh, I think we're about to go back into the main room but uh, Paul I might ask you to share a little bit in the plenary about this youth versus homeless oh. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, I can still see there's a few people who were just reconnecting their audio in the main group. Uh, Dalma, do you want to go first today um, and sharing maybe some insights from your breakout session? Are we are we all back? Yes. Okay. Um, um, I think we're nearly all back. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah. So um, we basically. Um, reflected uh, had a feedback on the on the morning sessions on the practical tools we we uh we heard in the morning um we discussed the different ways of uh, engaging uh, with youth and and uh, how it's um, important to to build the trust and also to to know that uh, the person might feel uh, might experience uh, anxiety and how it's important that even if one person shows up that's really a big step for them and and um, and, and to 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 engage in in the activities but the overall message was that we need to continue uh, try uh, uh, um, continue trying uh, to engage um, and we also talked about uh, boundaries and how they, uh, it can be challenging, but um, to keep them and uh, in the and but it also uh, it has its place and importance to to maintain uh, safety. Um, we did talk about um, a lot about uh, as a challenging as challenges and, and barriers, the funding, uh, how the funding uh, can be, uh, can set inappropriate targets and results and, and, and um, 
uh, how it will it doesn't uh, necessarily measure soft outcomes that are so important and and how it doesn't necessarily recognize how uh, 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 other uh, outcomes and, and results what are really important uh, for a young uh, person in, 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 in their lives. Um, and it was mentioned that the uh, organizations uh, should, should have a funding team that can uh, help. Uh, uh, we did talk about um, supervision and reflective practice and staff support and how important that the staff has a safe environment as well. We discussed so different ways of doing that, whether in a, a team days and reflective practice or cross uh, over meeting. We did talk about the challenges of the COVID uh, pandemic on both on staff and, uh, and on young people, how um, it was, uh, uh, they had been uh, so negatively um, affected by the multiple uh, lockdowns. Uh, and we talked about uh, how we going, like uh, that uh, there can be this anxiety of uh, getting out of lockdown but how uh, young, young people uh, adjust to things uh, very quickly. I think these were the main points that we covered uh, in our discussions, but there are more ideas on, on our ideas boards. Um, Perfect, yeah. and uh, we can share the links as well afterwards so people can go in to see what was being discussed in the, in the other groups. I mean, ours was very similar. We used uh, Katharina's presentation as kind of the jumping off point to look at what were some of the challenges that she mentioned. Um, and so we kind of spoke about um, sometimes the difficulty of working with young people, uh, whether you have an open door policy or whether you try and sign people up into closed groups. And that really was important is to meet the young people at their level. And so not to push them into something that they're not quite ready for. Uh, but also the preparation work that goes into it. So sometimes having meetings with them in advance of doing an activity and kind of getting their buy-in and to understand what the project is, what the service is, how they can work with it, um, et cetera. And the, one of the other challenges that we spoke about is sometimes we, I think particularly today, we focus quite heavily on the importance of group activities to build relationships and sense of community. But also if we talk about meeting people at their level, we need to also focus on one-to-one -one supports and that they can really provide um, a space for young people to explore themselves and to gain emotional literacy and to understand what their own needs are. And sometimes that's a really important um, stepping stone before we get into group activities and um, that they have kind of that emotional language um, to engage with other people, uh, whether it's other social workers or other young people in the services. And then we also spoke about other um, kind of artwork projects, graffiti projects, kayaking and other activities. Um, we had an interesting practice, um, Kira shared from Scotland, it's the Make It Happen project or the Make It Happen fund, which works to young people bring their own ideas of something that they want to do. And through that project, they've taken young people on trips or gone to a recording studio to create some music. Um, but the idea there is it's very much driven by the needs of the young people. Um, I think one of the topics, I'm gonna to hand over to Paul now, but one of the things that we ended up discussing in our group that I think is actually really important, um, and particularly when we look at it from the youth homelessness side, is this difference between um, well, what Paul described as either, you know, are you a homeless service working with young people or are you a youth service working with people that happen to be homeless? And uh, it's something that I personally, I haven't thought a whole lot of about in my own work, but I think Paul kind of raised a really interesting framing because it has a lot of impacts for how you run a service. Uh, Paul, if you'd like to unmute yourself and to share a little bit about that. I think you've just described it accurately. It's the framing. <laughs> That's exactly all it is. It's but maybe to say, like, why, why, in your experience, it's important. Well, I think the re now I'm a like I'm in home services twenty five years. Um, and the thing, everything about homelessness is always fix it. It's a problem. Uh, and then when I moved into youth services over ten years ago we kind of started to look at things a bit differently it was always about oh they can't come in they can't do this and you're kind of going what the hell are we about here 
So we started to look at ourselves a little bit differently. Um, and I started to employ youth workers and people who had no experience with homelessness. So they weren't bringing any preconceived ideas to the table. Um, and the deputy manager now of that particular drop-in centre is purely from uh, a youth community and youth background. So if you view youth as homeless, then we have literally given them that categorization of you're homeless, you're not, you're not young. Um, whereas if you flip the coin, uh, homelessness should be a sta uh, just a transitory stage, end of story. It, it, um, to use the, the psychotherapy terms, it should be a life transition. That's it, nothing more. Um, because if we keep calling you homeless, then we're saying that's all you're ever going to be. And the whole language game needs to be shifted. So it is literally that framing of the, the extension drop-in center, which is the youth service end of my services is, it's a youth service and the young people happen to be homeless. That is it. Because our, and Rock Trust, when they put up their aims is that people come out of homelessness. Um, it's a little bit like what Kira said, and even in our own organization, the language is we just we use language without thinking about it um we refer to people that have been housed as homeless and you're going no they've got a tenancy the 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 large funding agencies refer to them as how many homeless people do you have in tenancies it's a pure paradox so it is if you start if thinking about language and you start shifting your thinking about language you shift your attitude in what you're doing and we never see um it's the young people themselves exit that journey. We don't exit for them. So it's all about that. Like, um, they're the hero, not us. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to come in on that because it's something that, particularly I lead on Fiance's work on youth homelessness, and we often talk about youth work uh, and the youth work sector, but I think actually embedding that within the service rather than framing as homeless is something um, that I'm definitely going to take away uh, from these two days that we've had together. Um, if there's anything anybody would like to add, um, you can feel free to raise your hand, um, or if you prefer to put it into the chat box, you can. Um, otherwise, I think we might just bring the training to an end. Uh, obviously, with COVID, it's a pity we couldn't do this in person. Uh, there's lots of things Janssen wanted to do in person this year that just hasn't been made possible. Um, but it's something that Dalma and I have been thinking about doing for the last couple, last year or two. Uh, sometimes within Fianza, why I think one of my own criticisms would be that we can be quite siloed. Uh, so Dalma does all this wonderful work on mental health, and I'm doing all this work on youth homelessness. And even though we share an office, or we used to share an office, we don't necessarily integrate the work that we're doing and connect the two issues. And so I hope that maybe this is an online training for now, uh, but maybe in the next year or two, there'll be an opportunity to do something in person together, either at Fianza conferences or at a separate event where we all come together um, and to build on what we've done, because I think there's definitely lots of practices that we can bring together. And when we talk about homelessness in general, you know, still mental health is something that on in general is seems to be on the fringes and um, I think it's something that we need to do more on uh, sharing more practices and, and having better services in place. Dama, I'm not sure if there's anything you'd like to add from your side. No, I think as, uh, as Adam uh, Burley said yesterday, they bring the invisible uh, is that's what uh, often uh, mental health is uh, to to make it uh, more visible, and I think we at Fans uh, we are uh, committed to, to do that uh, as well. With you, <laughs> continue to do that. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this uh, training and to to be with us uh, two days uh, uh, in the morning. It it has been a great experience. Uh, thank you. Great, and thank you to all our speakers both yesterday and today for joining. I don't see anything else in the chat box or anyone raising their hands, so I'm going to bring it to an end. And just to say, uh, early next week, we'll be in touch with the presentations and recordings, etc., to watch it back. Um, and we'll probably be in touch with maybe some follow on steps in the coming weeks about what we'd like to do next. Okay, uh, with that, I'm going to end the training. Hope everyone has a lovely afternoon and evening and a good weekend.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.